Cast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you find yourself in the country today. We're going to get started in just a couple minutes. Uh, it looks like we've got a couple more people um, that have joined in the last few seconds. So we'll keep an eye on that and then we'll get started here in just a moment. Okay, well, we're a few minutes past the hour, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Looks like a few more people have have joined um, in that in that last couple of minutes, and and probably a couple more just signing on. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, again, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, to learn a little bit more about the Mid of Merit Standards Program and how you, uh, as an advisor, can be most effective in supporting your chapter's performance. We really, really appreciate your time. Um, before we dive into things, I'd first like to uh, introduce Nicole Belinsky, my co-presenter today. She's the Chapter Development Director for the fraternity and the staff member that works the most closely with this program. I've had the, the privilege of working closely with her on this program for the last few years, and, uh, and she's been a great resource for, for our organization. Um, my name is Dustin Roberts. I'm a Bradley DU from the class of 2003. I'm currently a member of the fraternity's board of directors and um, have the honor of serving as the chairman of the Mid of Merit Committee. Our outline for today is we're going to cover a little bit of a history and overview of the program, the makeup of our Mid of Merit Committee. We'll go into detail on the standards 
um, for the Men of Merit program and some trends that we've been seeing over the last few years. And then finally, a little bit more about how um, you can support as an advisor um, in those efforts to improve chapter performance. Um, primarily, our goal today is just to provide some additional insight into the program and to supplement the full Men of Merit details that, the, uh, that are available online. Um, I would encourage all of you to visit deltu.org uh, slash men of merit when you have a chance. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss how this program got started, how it operates, and who serves on the committee, but there are a lot more details out there and resources, um, anything from just information about the metrics to um, being able to um, submit some information for some of those items that are self-reported. Nicole's then gonna review the information about, the, uh, about some timeline. Um, key dates, data collection elements, and how um, you guys as, as advisors can um, help us support each standard. Feel free to submit questions uh, in writing, preferably via the chat feature in, uh, in the webinar, and we'll try to cover all of those at the end. Uh, I suspect that we'll have plenty of time for that, so we'll, uh, we'll try to walk through this as quickly as we can and then cover any questions that you might have today. If you think of anything beyond today, you're also more than welcome to reach out to Nicole or myself uh, with questions at any time. Um, so to jump right in, to just do a little bit of background or history on the Medimerit program, in 2014, the board of directors and the headquarters staff recognized the need to reallocate support that was provided by volunteers um, to focus more than, uh, on more than just chapters that were underperforming or, or doing exceptionally well. So the concern was that chapters performing kind of in that mid-range or in an average capacity were maybe overlooked a little bit. And um, we wanted to brainstorm ways that we could better support those, um, you know, that majority of chapters and help kind of steer them to, uh, to bigger and better things. So the, you know, the board and the staff reviewed what that program might look like to garner excellence from groups rather than letting chapters potentially gradually decline. At the same time, the board was in discussion regarding updating the minimum standards for a chapter. And these two conversations as they occurred um, sort of evolved into a program that was designed to support engaged chapters on their performance before there was a potential decline in meeting fraternities' expectations. So to uh, determine what metrics would be used, a list of standards was developed and brought to the 2015 Leadership Institute. Where members were able to provide feedback, and the undergraduate advisory board, or UGAB, was utilized as a focus group. And based on that feedback, staff and the board uh, formally implemented the program for the 2015 2016 academic year. The guiding philosophy is that chapters will perform and operate at a higher level when there are relevant and structured benchmarks to achieve. So kind of an overview of how the program works. Um, it now serves first and foremost as an annual assessment tool to help the fraternity better allocate resources to serve chapters. So throughout the year, the staff collects data and information pertaining to each of the 11 metrics. Um, some of these are reported by chapters or host institutions, such as uh, service hours or uh, GPA coming from institutions. Uh, others are simply measured by the, um, by the fraternity itself, such as program attendance. Um, a lot of Men of Merit scorecards, uh, it, the Men of Merit scorecard is used to illustrate a chapter's operational performance. It's one illustration of that. Um, it's not the only illustration of that, uh, but there, it is uh, a helpful tool to evaluate operational performance and provide um, each chapter with that scorecard in the summer so that staff and advisors can use that information as a tool to help in the in the coming year um, to help address you know, strengths and weaknesses appropriately. So what we do from a committee standpoint is um, to help kind of bring in an added resource for uh, particular chapters. So the committee plays an active role in using that Men of Merit data to support and mentor chapters. Currently, the committee consists of about 20 volunteers, most of whom are professionals in higher education, um, or former fraternity staff members, or in some cases, both. Um, since the creation of the program, that committee has had a role in working with chapters primarily that do not perform to a minimum expectation in a majority of the standards. Um, this year, 
is the second year we formalized that process and, and the accountability measures. So chapters were sent their minimum scorecards in the summer, and that's roughly at the end of July. Depending on their performance in the past year, some were asked to complete um, what we developed as a, an action plan or an improvement plan for the upcoming year. The chapters then, would then complete that action plan and a committee member would be assigned to work with the chapter to provide an additional layer of support, um, directing them to resources and helping them with accountability for the goals that they've set. So these folks have essentially been paired with chapters that are underperforming chapters to see if they can effectively raise the bar in identifying what areas maybe are of most um, are of greatest urgency or of greatest importance and to not necessarily solve all problems at once, but to simply insert a, um, an additional advisor into the equation that might help them move the ball forward, so to speak. Um, so as I, I mentioned earlier, there are 11 standards that are measured within the MedAmerit program. Most of them are categorized using three benchmarks. A chapter could either fall at minimum, at expectation, or be aspirational within each standard. Uh, there's one exception to that, which is simply the Associate Member Education Program, or AME, um, which is a either either they're utilizing it or they're not utilizing it. Uh, to to the um, to to quantify what's necessary to reach each level within the standard, we point to what I mentioned earlier under the website. We've got those details in under the Minute Merit page. Um, we're also going to review some additional information um, that's pertinent to the advisors here today, um, going through each standard next and emphasizing due dates and that sort of thing. Um, so for that, I will uh, turn it over to Nicole. Nicole? Thank you so much, Justin. So I'm going to take us through standard by standard, the Men of Merit program, and I'm going to aim to connect um, your role as advisors into each standard as I move through the program. So the first standard we will review is B chapter plan. On this slide, you will see the three levels of the Chapter Excellence Plan standard. This standard was updated over the past summer to accommodate for trends that we as staff and volunteers were seeing in chapter completion. So you will note that um, each level for this standard has decreased 10% for this academic year. There are two time periods throughout the academic year which CEP items are due. The fall submission deadline is due on December 30th. The spring submission and yearly submission deadline is June 1st. The portal for CEP submissions is currently open, so chapters and colonies can be actively submitting that information now. CEP submissions occur through a form submitted on the Delta Epsilon website. Staff work diligently to review these submissions on a rolling basis in order to provide feedback and scores in the weeks following the June 1st deadline. More often than not, we see below minimum scores in the area of CEP due to lack of reporting on the chapter's behalf. We hear accounts of chapters that say they actually completed many of the criteria, but just forgot or for some reason did not report it through the portal. Providing evidence of completion is important to receive all available points because sometimes as staff, we do associate half points for submissions if they meet some of the criteria, but not all. Examples of evidence for submission include pictures, agendas, descriptive outlines, letters of support. We recommend that each chapter includes a who, what, where, when, and how format in each CEP submission and is careful to make sure that they are submitting under the correct criteria. Advisors, you all can provide support in CEP completion by recommending that each executive board utilizes CEP criteria to lay out a chapter calendar at the start of each semester and be heavily discussed during goal setting each year. This enables the opportunity for you and other advisors to serve as accountability measures in CEP completion throughout a semester. The most successful chapters take time to submit CEP at each executive board meeting and track their submissions utilizing some sort of Excel or any other tracker document. There is an Excel temp template 
for CEP submission tracking on the resource page of the Delta Upsilon website. Additionally, there may be times where an advisor verification letter is the best method of showing that a chapter completed a certain criteria. Making yourself available to support the chapter and submitting a verification letter will prove helpful. Moving on to our second standard today of membership. The membership criteria compares the roster count of a chapter that's provided on our IHQ roster with the IFC community membership average reported by an institution. Generally, on a chapter scorecard, you will see the spring membership total reflected. As advisors, the best way to be supportive through this standard is to ensure that the chapter has a definitive recruitment plan and that the chapter sets goals for a 365 recruitment, meaning recruiting all year long. Our hope is that each chapter can work to meet the average IFC chapter size on their campus or have 35 members, whichever is greater. Next standard, which was mentioned previously by Dustin as um, a unique standard, the Associate Member Education Program. There are only two levels for this standard. A chapter may fall at expectation or below minimum within the Associate Member Education Standard. A chapter is deemed to be utilizing the Associate Member Education process, thus at expectation, if you as a chapter advisor confirm that there was significant implementation of the program throughout the associate member period. This would mean that you all would need to be involved or at least present for the planning meetings for associate member education meetings in order to confirm that there was a significant implementation of this program. That confirmation from you all will take place via the advisory support verification form that is due from one advisor from each chapter. This should be completed in the month of May. The Associate Member Education Workbook and the Facilitation Guide are available on our website in a PDF form, which lends them to be easily printed for chapter use. If a chapter would like a bound copy from of the workbook and facilitator's guide, chapters can request they be sent from IHQ for a small fee. As advisors, please ensure that chapters are utilizing the Associate Member Education Plan as we prescribe. This is an award-winning program that we have staff members specifically designated to update and design. While it is okay to include some education on specific chapter history, it is best that the Vice President of Member Education and or Associate Member Educator facilitates the full and complete eight-week program with minimal additions or edits. We understand that some institutions mandate a shorter Associate Member process, and that is fine. Um, you can modify the program to fit within, um, let's say, six or four weeks. However, we are, do become concerned when additional traditions or information is required um, to be shared with associate members, as that's usually how we see um, some, some risk management situations arise. Moving on to the standard of scholarship. Average chapter GPAs are reflected on each chapter scorecard for both the fall and the spring semesters. These GPAs include the chapter's associate members. The GPA points that are collected by staff and represented on scorecards include the chapter's GPA, all fraternity average GPA, and all men's average GPA at the chapter's specific institution. Chapters may sometimes become frustrated because they don't believe the GPAs reported are reflective of their true membership, which is when staff emphasizes how important it is to accurately report membership to their fraternity and sorority office and to IHQ. There are times when IHQ staff is not able to collect GPAs from a given institution until chapters submit forms and fulfill obligations to their institution. Advisors can help to ensure that all required reporting is provided to an institution by the end of the academic term so that this is not the case. 
In terms of scholarship promotion, I recommend to, the, to you all as advisors to work with your vice president of academic excellence or academic excellence review committee so that they can meet with members that are not meeting academic standards. It's helpful that you all as an advisor also attend those meetings for a greater sense of accountability for both the vice president of academic excellence and for the member that might not be performing well academically. Next standard is learning assessment. The learning assessment standard reflects both the membership outcome survey and Greek life EDU completion for each chapter. We will first discuss Greek life EDU completion. There are two parts to the Greek Life EDU program that must be completed in entirety in order for the chapter to have the proper completion reflected within Men of Merit. I want to make a special note that there is a 14-day pause period in between part one and part two of the program to allow for assessment results. This has recently been shortened from 30 days in previous years to hopefully allow for greater completion from chapters and associate members. A best practice is for the vice president of membership education or an associate member educator to keep track of the associate member's Greek Life EDU completion. In terms of Greek Life EDU, we, also, we often see chapters struggle to finish part two of the program since it is not unlocked until that intercession period is over. To best ensure completion, I recommend that, that associate members carve out time to take the program together during or after an associate member meeting. That way, two weeks following, members can complete part two as a group as well. Chapters receive a deduction in insurance fees when members complete part one and part two of the program. The percentage that you will see reflected on your Men of Merit scorecard for each chapter is the completion for all members within the chapter, not just for associate members. A chapter may at any time request a list of who has completed the program from their chapter from their assigned staff liaison. The second component of the learning assessment standard is the membership outcome survey. The membership outcome survey data helps staff determine support mechanisms, programs, and determine trends for a chapter. We have seen full completion of the survey for chapters that set aside time at a chapter meeting to complete together. We highly suggest this practice and have seen it to be very effective. The only means necessary is for chapter membership to bring a computer with them to a chapter meeting. Moving on to the standard of loss prevention. Seven factors play into a chapter's loss prevention score. These items include past loss prevention policy violations, a chapter's claims or loss history, the chapter's Greek Life EDU training program completion, a chapter's educational conference and program attendance, the existence of a chapter facility, substance-free housing, if applicable for a chapter, and property inspections within a facility, if applicable. If you have any questions regarding your chapter's loss prevention credits, I recommend that you reach out to Carl Grindle, the Associate Executive Director on staff. For additional information, I wanted to make available this graphic that breaks down available loss prevention credits. I wanna draw special attention to point six, which is in bold because this will be the last year that that will be configured into a chapter's loss prevention credits as we move forward to the substance free housing full implementation policy beginning in August of 2020. The next standard is accounts receivable. When configuring the men of merit performance, of the accounts receivable standard, we look at the status of a chapter's finances at the end of the fiscal year. 
If a chapter is not financially current with IHQ throughout the year, they should be working with their assigned staff liaison and you all as advisors to develop a payment plan. If a chapter is on a payment plan and adhering to this plan, they will find themselves at minimum in the standard rather than below minimum if they are not financially current. This standard was also subtly modified over the summer to just include the end of the fiscal year as the benchmark rather than having two benchmarks throughout the year. The service standard. The fraternity is moving into the second year of utilizing the helper helper application to collect service hours. Staff utilizes the total service hours reported on helper helper from a chapter divided by the chapter's February roster number to find the service hours completed per man for each chapter. Staff utilizes the February roster number so that we are not requiring any associate members recruited to the chapter in the spring semester to recruit as many service or to complete as many service hours as we would require or expect from a member that's been in the chapter the entirety of the academic year. Staff has seen that there are still several chapters that aren't utilizing the helper helper platform in full. As advisors, I recommend taking time to review the documents and videos that are on the Delta Ypsilon website to better understand and be able to articulate the platform to your chapter leadership. Under the Advisor Resource tab on the website, there are recordings of past webinars facilitated, facilitated by staff at Helper Helper to educate advisors on the operations. I also welcome chapter leadership to also watch view those webinars as they may also find them helpful. Staff has placed a special emphasis this year on educating membership on the difference between philanthropy and service. By the end of the week, I will have a resource available on the website um, under the Vice President of External Relations position to allow for chapters to utilize, utilize a handout to educate members on the difference in terms. Next standard is advisory support and heavily pertinent to you all. In late April or May, like I mentioned earlier, I will contact all individuals noted as chapter advisors to complete an advisory support verification form. The form collects the following information. How many advisors are on a chapter's advisory board? How many advisors are in weekly communication with member of the chapter leadership, if there is a housing corporation for the chapter, the quantity of webinars reviewed by advisors, both live or a recording, and the extent that the associate member education plan was adhered to. Only one advisor from each chapter needs to submit this form. However, undergraduate members from a chapter are not permitted to submit this form on behalf of the advisory board. If you all have any questions in regards to this form, please let me know. Um, or if it's unclear in any way, I welcome feedback so that this can be completed as efficiently from you all as I know that a lot is expected from you all as advisors. Let's talk about educational programs. Over the summer, we have updated the educational program attendance standard to reflect what is noted on your screen. I'm going to briefly cover this standard a little bit deeper because um, there has, have been some more broad changes to the standard. So moving forward, the aspiration level will ask that each chapter has at least 15 members or 15% of the chapter attend a Delta Upsilon education program. This also includes at least four members at Leadership Institute. The expectation level expects that chapters attend at least or send at least eight members to attend Delta Upsilon educational programs, and at least two members are at Leadership Institute. 
we provide two complementary registrations to Leadership Institute. Therefore, it is the expectation that those two complementary registrations are utilized by each chapter. The minimum level for this standard is that chapters have at least six members attend a DU educational program, including at least one member at the Leadership Institute. You will notice on your screen that chapters will no longer fall below minimum if they do not utilize all of their programs attendance scholarships. However, we hope that you all as advisors will help communicate the ex expectation that all scholarships should be utilized for the chapter's benefit. Advisors can support the chapter in the standard by ensuring that chapter finances can support members in attending educational programs. Advisors can also help to ensure the leadership knows and can articulate the benefits of attending an educational program. I do want to share the dates for programs coming up um, this academic year. President's Academy, intended for chapter presidents, will occur on January 3rd through 6th. The registration deadline is December 6th. RLA West and South will be February 7th through 9th. RLA for the Northeast and Great Plains regions will be February 14th through 16th. RLA for the Midwest will be February 21st through 23rd. Leadership Institute next year will take place July 30th through August 2nd in Orlando. DUAL, our Delta Upsilon Emerging Leaders Program, will take place June 1st through 5th of next summer. Our last standard, philanthropy. This standard measures fundraising specifically for the Global Service Initiative. There are three ways to track and submit the fundraising that occurs for the Global Service Initiative to IHQ. You can submit via credit card on the website, via check that is mailed to IHQ, or by calling IHQ during business hours and providing account information. In addition to fundraising for the Global Service Initiative, staff encourages chapters to fundraise for other nonprofit efforts that may be near and dear to a chapter. Chapters or advisors can nominate a fundraising effort, event, or something noteworthy in terms of philanthropy for a chapter award in recognition during Leadership Institute. As advisors, I encourage you all to further encourage the chapter to seek out fundraising events that seem to appeal to their given campus or surrounding a community. We see that chapters are able to fundraise the most money when they invite community members to come and take part in fundraising effort. Dustin, I am now going to turn it back to you. Thanks, Nicole. Um, so all the information that Nicole just noted above is, um, is then compiled and displayed in the form of a scorecard that we mentioned previously and is represented on, on your screen here. So just to kind of go through the items and interview again how those, um, how those data points are collected a little bit. So um, some items are reported by campus, uh, such as GPA and membership numbers, including campus averages. Some items are reported um, actually by you, the advisors. The, that includes the associate member education program utilization, as was mentioned before. And then also, of course, the, uh, the advisor support components. So there's a few different advisor support components. That includes um, you know, whether or not a chapter has a separate um, housing corporation board, if, uh, if applicable, how many advisors serve on an advisory board, how many are in weekly communication with a chapter, um, and how many webinars have um, have been attended by um, by the advisors um, involved in a chapter? And then uh, lastly, there are a number of items that are recorded by staff um, by the by the headquarters throughout the year. Um, chapter excellence plan submissions for one, um, which is something that will um, that you can also uh, um, view and track now online. Um, program attendance loss prevention um, details, and accounts receivable, of course. 
Um, some of the trends we wanted to kind of just walk through or review with um, with you all today as well that we've seen, uh, particularly in the past year and, and through the last three or four years uh, coming out of this uh, this effort um, that are really uh, helpful to us to kind of frame these discussions and, and to uh, maybe allocate our resources, particularly when it comes to volunteers with a very finite um, you know amount of amount of time. Um, so in the past year in particular, just some numbers, we had 29 chapters that fell below minimum in in over 50% of the categories, um, which means that those were those were the groups that um, we were trying to capture in particular to maybe get some additional support. That's kind of the the benchmark that we had set for for that support. Um, CEP was the standard that fell below minimum the most. Um, there were 16 chapters that scored at um, at minimum and above uh, for the current year. To do that, chapters need 50% completion to be at minimum. Um, again, that is actually a metric that's been adjusted from previous years. Um, so we would, uh, for some reasons that I'll discuss here in a minute as well, uh, typically recommend that that be sort of a starting point in the conversation with um, with your undergraduates. In, uh, in the past, we saw a trend that if a chapter met aspiration or expectation level in the CEP, um, they also met expectation or aspiration um, level for advisory support. There is a very strong and direct positive correlation between those two metrics. Um, we've also saw that that correlation typically carried forward um, to our award nominees and, and award winners when it came to um, annual fraternity awards um, and, uh, and things like that, which would, probably isn't terribly surprising. Um, there are um, also positive correlations between chapters that met aspirational uh, levels for advisory support and for accounts receivable. So again, probably not terribly surprising, um, but those with the most sound financial management um, also tended to have the, the highest level or score the highest levels on uh, advisory support. Uh, loss prevention, associate member education, utilization, and accounts receivable were standards that the chapters most often met expectation um, or uh, achieved the aspirational level. And this uh, could be for a number of reasons. Associate member education, for example, is the one that we noted is um, it's it's really a pass fail, um, it, so to speak, in terms of utilization or not. And uh, and it's it's something that a lot of chapters, without that program implementation um, and resource from the fraternity, um, didn't necessarily have uh, in place as a as a structured program. So that makes sense. Um, the accounts receivable is, is fantastic. A lot of that credit probably is due to, you know, to, to both advisory support and more recent programs um, and uh, outside vendors that kind of help um, outsource that, that role, uh, where historically that's been a little bit more difficult in-house effort. And, uh, and then loss prevention is just, a, it's nice to see that that was the case. Um, that that was, was one of the three that stood out the most as um, chapters most often meeting expectation or aspirational. Um, so what standards can advisors particularly support in? And it, really the short answer is generally all of them. Um, in particular, we um, were really focused both from a committee effort standpoint and from a program in general, um, more on sort of the the why or the, the philosophy behind it. And so one of the main things that we'd like advisors to be able to help us do is to sort of erase the, you know, but we did that or but we are doing that mentality. And a lot of that comes from simply helping uh, helping your chapters be a little bit more organized and maybe a little bit more um, deliberate through the year and getting some of those, some of those easy wins um, checked off. So if you were working, for example, as I mentioned with the CEP, if, if you kind of look at that as a blueprint throughout the year, generally speaking, that drives a lot of the other metrics um, up gradually. So just by the nature of, of sort of utilizing that as a tool, we see that a lot of the metrics tend to, to start to rise a little bit because of a lot of it is just based on what we know, or what the fraternity knows is going on. And so we really want chapters to um, to share what they're doing. And a lot of times that's that's the gap. Um, not necessarily that they aren't doing it. Um, standards that can contribute uh, to better chapter operational performance that we emphasize in addition to CEP include things like GPA, program attendance, um, 
membership size and accounts receivable. Uh, those are things that tend to help propel success the most in other metrics, um, just from the data that we've collected and reviewed, and that those are the trends that we've seen over the past four years. So CEP, GPA, program attendance, um, membership numbers, and accounts receivable are, are areas of particular emphasis, emphasis if, um, if you're looking for you know, prioritizing goals and that sort of thing. Um, the, it looks like from the past year, we had a dozen chapters that had advisory boards that met aspirational qualifications. So just to review, um, that meant a board with a total of um, eight members or more, including three that had um, reported weekly contact with chapter leadership, a separate house corporation board, if applicable, and uh, advisors participated in at least four webinars per year, which is probably, um, you know, including including like this one, probably the most um, achievable of, of those factors or those bullet points. Um, you know, the advisory support standard will be um, aspirational or at expectation if um, we're at least at that, that middle box with a total of five members in an advisory board. Again, a lot of this is self-reported. And so it, if you have questions on how to do that, feel free to reach out to us. That, that's a resource and a portal that's available um, through the website. Um, and uh, lastly, a note on the webinars, um, they don't have to be attended live actually to get credit for them. We do record these and they are saved under those, uh, under those resources on the website. So if you're looking for them, you'd wanna look for resources and advisor resources on the website. Um, we typically aim to host, um, the, the headquarters puts out um, about one per month during the academic year. Um, we did this something similar um, this time last year, and we'll probably continue to do that. And I know that there was one last month as well. So plenty of opportunities to at least get that um, that metric um, and that box checked uh, for for the advisory support um, piece. And uh, so lastly, we've got a couple of um, images to review our uh, some of the key dates throughout the academic year that Nicole touched on a little bit. Um, in particular, just wanted to review, you know, what's coming up in the near future. So as we get into fall, um, you know, October uh, um, rosters and, and dues and loss prevention fees at the beginning of this month. So heading into the next couple of months, you've got things like GSI scholarships and applications. Um, that goes for the, um, the January uh, trip. And then uh, also we have uh, registration coming up for our winter educational programs. Um, such as Presence Academy, which, um, believe it or not, will come, I'm sure, very quickly at the very beginning of January. It seems hard to believe that that will be in 2020, but um, I'm sure that will be here very quickly. So then, then the, the Chapter Excellence Plan um, submission date for December 30th is one to keep a particular eye on um, from an operational standpoint. And then, of course, uh, going into the spring, the next educational programs will take place in February with the regional leadership academies happening across the country um, and so on and so forth. So you kind of get an idea of, of all the things to keep track of. One of the things that I think from an advisor standpoint that you can help with the most is, um, is that organization, is that sort of um, um, administrative effort. We find that there is um, a, there are a lot of chapters that would raise their um, their level in a number of these metrics simply with that assistance. And so when we are involved, for example, from a committee standpoint, one of the first things we look at is, you know, what are, our, what are, what are the, what are our most important goals, you know, things like membership or GPA or, or philanthropy, but also what are those things, what are those easy wins? You know, how can we kind of build momentum? And some of those things um, include the, the Greek Life EDU and the membership assessment or the outcomes assessment surveys um, under learning assessment, that, um, you know, that's one that is completely under the chapter's control. It's just a matter of getting it done. And so a lot of times if you can be organized enough to, to sort of check that box, it builds momentum and, and helps them um, kind of turn some of those, uh, some of those metrics into expectation or aspirational levels from, from a previous year. So um, that, I think that organization and that stewardship is really probably one of the, the best areas that, um, advisors can can support us in so with that um, i'm going to wrap up and see if we have any questions that have come through 
uh, via chat. Uh, I believe um, if you can see any of those, Nicole, feel free to um, throw them out and, and I'll answer them as best I can. I did see one question um, stating, how do these standards relate to a colony or new chapter as compared to an established chapter? Um, and I will go ahead and just share that um, the chartering requirements for a colony mirror the 11 standards within Men of Merit. So we're additionally working with the colony to meet the expectation level for each standard within Men of Merit prior to becoming a formal chapter. So then once they have um, hit that formalized metric and become a a chapter of Delta Plum are initiated into the fraternity, they already have the expectations laid forth for future executive boards that this is how a productive and efficient chapter operates. Yeah, good question. Um, I, I'd add that, you know, one of the, one of the, um, you know, kind of benchmarks or, or guiding philosophies from developing this program probably goes back even further than 2014 to um, to really a, a previous sort of five-year strategic plan from the organization. Um, one, of, one of the objectives in that strategic plan was to kind of work towards building more um, consistency of brand and, and, you know, kind of being true to, to who we are as an organization. And, and that's, from a value standpoint, that's great. And that's, that's important from, to, to execute with messaging. Um, in operational um, terms, this is one of those ways that we can go about doing that. And so, as a colony, you you know you have a certain you're given a certain expectation that yeah, these are standards that we uphold, and we you know we try to preserve the kind of integrity of the organization as a whole by doing that. Um, and and that's this is part of that effort is to say you know yeah we do have kind of a, a standard and. And we are going to, you know, help chapters achieve it and and hold chapters accountable if they don't. Um, and I think that's your right as a as a, a colony that's been given, um, you know, certain expectations to um, to becoming a chapter, and joining an organization that that we do that and that we continue to do that. Another question. Any other questions? Post is some of the suggestions here suggest stepping out of the advisor role to just the specific officer. Any thoughts on how to best extend that reach? Um, can you uh, can you repeat that quickly? I think I caught all of it, but I might have missed the middle part. Some of the suggestions here suggest stepping out of the advisor role to just the specific officer. Any thoughts on how to ex extend that reach? Sure, so I think generally speaking, um, I know that the, the advisor structure and makeup um, from chapter to chapter varies quite a bit. Um, so in, in some cases there are um, there are advisors that are specifically tied to certain operational areas or certain undergraduate officers. Um, so I think you're referring to maybe the other circumstance if there are, um, you know, just a, um, you know, one or a few advisors that cover more of a, um, a general approach. And in that sense, you know, as the advisor, if you're, um, you know, if it's a team of one, you're really kind of, um, you know, spreading across each operational area. Um, so in that case, I, I would say, you know, see if it's possible to recruit a broader team of advisors um, or identify, you know, each res whatever resources are out there to help you with that effort, um, such as just reaching out to the, the headquarters or, or us if it's a chapter that's working with, with a, a committee mentor. Um, there are resources on the website for each particular officer and for each particular advisor, um, and they are driven by a specific operational areas, so you can um, you can kind of look to those as well. But uh, I, it sounds to me like something that would be a kind of a case by case um, situation if you're not um, as familiar with specific um, chapter officer roles. We have another question here. 
Um, this program started by being focused on chapters with middle level performance. The focus has moved to supporting low performing chapters. Any thoughts of returning to the original goal in some way? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, I think that in a perfect world, we would be able to um, have a one-on-one -on -one relationship between an additional volunteer and all chapters. Um, and I can tell you that the original sort of, I would say, um, the original watermark in terms of, you know, who to get an action plan from and, and get uh, a committee member or a mentor assigned to them, what is higher. Um, so we really are kind of working our way up that um, as as our, you know, as our manpower allows. Um, the main focus is on the chapters that um, they, they don't have, they don't necessarily need additional support or they're not having, they're not getting additional attention for, for negative reasons or for loss prevention reasons, for example. But um, they are chapters that we, we are concerned with, you know, the sustainability. And if we can help to allocate our volunteer resources to improving them. Um, so the, uh, I think the, the fundamental approach is to, to not, um, is to not ignore chapters just because they don't have a loss prevention issue really in practice. Um, but we do kind of work from a little bit from the bottom up in terms of the scorecard stuff um, to assess each one and find where we can you know improve each metric and so the i think the hope is that over the years we kind of work our way up that um, up that slope a little bit um, but it really is dependent a little bit on um, just the amount of resources that we have available so um, that's a good question a good point um, it, it it does simply from the uh you know from the committee that's what we do from a committee standpoint it also I think has some impact just from the assessment standpoint. So we are assessing all chapters and that in and of itself um, lends some visibility and some additional conversation to those chapters that are maybe in the middle and they are more likely to, you know, with that information in hand to be able to see maybe where to um, work with their, you know, their resources with their advisors and, and their, um, leadership at the undergraduate level to improve themselves. Um, what we find with the chapters that are underperforming is that one of the keys to getting them up to that middle um, majority is actually, you know, maybe the lack of some additional um, advisory support. So that's, that's where we find that probably the best use of our volunteer resources is to kind of lift those boats and then, uh, and then kind of go from year to year in that way. So I hope that somewhat answers your question, but it's a, it's a great question. Ideally, the team would be, the team would be 80 instead of 20. Um, and then we could, we could just simply say, we're going to have a mentor for every chapter every year. I don't see any other questions at this time, but Dustin and I can hang out for a few additional minutes in case there are any additional questions. Um, we really appreciate all of your time um, and commitment to instituting the Men of Merit Standards Program and utilizing it to gauge operational success within our chapters. So thank you all for everything that you do. Um, we appreciate y'all. So we did have an additional thought. What about a volunteer mentor as opposed to paid staff? Just train people to do it and it increases coverage. Yeah, say that again. What about a volunteer mentor as opposed to paid staff? Just train people to do it and it increases coverage. 
Joseph, I think that that's an interesting perspective. Um, we do utilize a volunteer structure and a staff structure to support our chapters and colonies. Um, so we do take time to train our volunteers um, and they contribute um, a certain amount of hours each week to support our chapters that may be underperforming or have more left to give. Um, however, there are, is still a need for that greater support and people who are wholly devoted to supporting chapters from a, a staff perspective. Yeah, yeah, no, I, that's uh, that's a, a great comment, and that's um, in a sense that's exactly what we're um, you know what we're doing a little bit here with this uh, with this program. So the folks that are on the committee, for example, are 20 additional volunteers. Um, they were um, recruited in large part because they have some familiarity with the with the subject matter, and therefore um, it, the you know, their their training would potentially be um, more efficient and they would be more effective in jumping into those conversations and helping support chapters. So that's why higher education um, professionals and former um, fraternity staff members were were recruited in particular um, in a lot of cases. So those 20 people are adding an additional level of support on a volunteer basis. Um, just like our province governors in each of our province are, you know, have been doing um, for years, they just have now um, some more focused effort on particular groups to try to get them, you know, to maybe stop um, stop momentum in one direction and, and kind of steer them back in the other direction. And, and if, you know, it, that can be assessed on a case by case basis, if one of the, you know, one of the weaknesses identified is, is maybe a lack of of um, strong advisory support, then one of the things that that, met, that volunteer can be doing is to identify that and to help the chapter recruit, and you know, one advisor and then maybe a second advisor or something like that. So that's um, that's a, a great point. That is, in a sense, exactly what the committee does: is that they take the they they take some of that workload and they supplement what the staff does because they are um, they're also working to support all chapters. Um, not just by traveling and sitting down with them, but in developing programs and and um, and another you know um, more macro ways. So, I hope that answers your question or addresses the the comment. So now we're just about up to, I guess it'd be one o'clock on the East Coast. Um, so we'll probably wrap up here. If um, if any of you have any questions that you'd rather, uh, you know, reach out to us with offline, um, feel free to do that. Uh, my email address and Nicole's email address are both listed there, and I think they're also both easily accessible on the fraternity website. Um, I'm in Mountain Time. So I'm a couple hours behind Nicole there, but uh, you know, do this on a volunteer basis. So um, really, anytime if you want to reach out, um, I'd be happy to hear from you. So if there are any other questions, I think we'll help you go ahead and wrap up for today. Is there anything else coming through, Nicole? I don't think so. Okay. Well, thank you all again for your time and, and for, uh, for your effort working with our chapters. And I look forward to, uh, to speaking with many of you sometime in the near future. Have a great day and a good week. Thanks all. Bye-bye.